Hello friends, it is time to pour some tea and talk about synthesizers and film editing and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I have been thinking lately about making this weird video essay thing about particular flavor of signal degradation that I enjoy and have always enjoyed and um, that I noticed in other people's music and that kind of set me on a journey of trying to figure out how to make those sounds for myself. And oddly enough, the paradigm that helped me understand what I wanted came from a book about film editing. So before I jump into synth stuff, today's book recommendation is In the Blink of an Eye by Walter Murch. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful text. If you're a filmmaker, if you work in the film and television industry, if you're just a, a lover of movies, um, this book is wonderful to pick up. I've kind of marked it up. It's, it's on its way to being dog-eared. Um, wonderful text. Pick it up. The, the paradigm that has helped me understand what I'm going to talk about tonight is Walter has this idea, and I'm paraphrasing and probably honestly adding to uh, this idea to a certain degree because, you know, as you get older, you start to forget stuff and you start to fill in gaps with your own stories, and that's how fishing tales are born. Uh, <clears throat> but essentially, I want to talk about various ways that I like taking pretty sounds and destroying them by removing parts of them at the sample level. Um, in other words, we're talking about sample rate reduction, which is a process that is typically relegated to the digital realm. Although the first thing I'm going to show you is how to do sample or a bit reduction, bit crushing type thing um, in the analog realm, which is a lot of fun. It sounds awesome. Um, but essentially, we're taking a look at ways to to take audio and create gaps that are interesting and kind of break it at the like subatomic level. And for whatever reason, that process really speaks to me musically and I, I find it beautiful. Um, but we're gonna need some audio to destroy first. So let's, uh, we're gonna use the teletype Just Friends combo. Again, these are connected behind the module with I2C so they can talk to each other even though you know physical cables are not patched up front. And we're going to put just friends in synth mode with jf.mode1. Boom. Now you see, since we're on sound and cycle, um, essentially it's like giving little rhythmic pulses of sound. Um, let me patch this up so you can hear. We'll just do the mix. Jack, which is all the voices. Yeah, there you go. We'll slow it down. We'll just get a sine wave dialed up here. I'm gonna set the scale for our experiments today just at C major. And in script one, we will just create a very basic generative note sequencer, um, just so we kind of have something interesting playing into these different modules and processes that we're gonna talk about. So, we will do jf.vox, which is a, a an op that is uh, going to speak to an individual voice. Zero, if we entered uh, zero as the argument here, it would address all of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So if I said jf.vox... One. I'm going to turn this to sound transient, so it will only fire when I enter this command. We could say we want the first voice to play the scale note X at velocity or volt 3. And then below that, we're going to make X a random number between negative 12 and 15. So one octave down, a little bit more than an octave up. I really like that range. And when I fire that script manually, you can hear the note. Right? Um, but I'm going to do something a little more interesting. 
And instead of saying voice one, I want to say voice y. We're going to assign that variable. So y is going to be a random number between one, four. So now, every time I fire this script, a different voice. Between one and four. Is gonna play a random note. Take a drink of this tea. Ginger tea again. I'm, I'm on a kick. It's really good. Some stevia in there, too. The little liquid drops. Mm, come on. Um, yeah, slurp noises. I guess that's going to be part of it. All right, so if we go back to sound cycle. Now, the natural rhythm of sound cycle and synth mode can be interrupted by firing off this script. And you can create really cool rhythms that way. Um, and what we will do for now is in the metro, which is a metronome script, right? It runs at a certain rhythm, and we can define that. We can say we want you to run at uh, 85, because that's the year I was born. Ha! Beats per minute. And in that metro script, if we say script 1, then it's going to fire... 85 beats per minute right on the on a four count or whatever I don't know what I'm saying but if we wanted to be more fun than that let's introduce an element of probability and say let's give it like a 40% chance of firing okay great that ought to be interesting enough to do for now because I am a stereo fiend. I like wiring these individual voices up. Um, several people asked about this module in the last video. It's called Nearness um, or TXN, which is a 2HP version. And I think the newer version of Nearness is 2HP. This one is 3HP, which is infuriating uh, sometimes unless you have a bunch of harvest min modules, in which case it balances the scales. If you know, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's basically just a little mixer, right? So it's a summing mixer, and the closer you plug something in to this input, the it increases its weight in the stereo mix. I'm going to pull this one. So now we've got a nice little uh, stereo sequence going on. And that's cool. All right, so we've got some material to break. Let's make sure it's nice and pretty. And the first modules I want to talk about are my, uh, I think, Desert Island musical tools, the Time Safari Mark II. This is a 16-bit digital delay that can work as a looper as well. It's basically just a little buffer playground. And I only have one sound of Thunder uh, Expander. If you have one and you want to sell it to me, let's talk. Because I would love another one for, for this deal. But these modules are no longer being produced. Um, they're made by the Harvestman, which is now Industrial uh, Music Electronics, IME. And I love them because... It basically, the sampling frequency knob gives you access to the sampling frequency of the delay. And um, <clears throat> to just jump into what that sounds like um, and why I think it's cool, I'm going to take these guys and let's make them the outputs. Mmm, delicious noise. And we will send into our inputs here. Our sequence. So 
So we're running it in stereo, which um, reduces the fidelity further. But what's fun about this module is uh, with the expander, you can change the bit depth of the audio. So uh, watch your ears while I change this real quick. Clear the buffer. So now we're in 12-bit mode, which is a little bit cleaner than what you were hearing before. But if we were to crank that down and let it record, the signal gets this just beautiful, like, hairiness. And that is because at those bit depths, essentially, it's incapable of sampling the audio coming from just friends, that nice pretty sine wave that we, we listened to a second ago. It's incapable of reproducing that because we're not giving it enough sample points. Um, and so... Here's the idea from Walter Murch that I'm obsessed with, and I think really holds true in music too. He talks about why uh, film, when projected at 24 frames per second, is interesting to us. And his theory, or maybe mine if I'm making this up or adding to his text, was that when the shutter passes in front of the, the film, and when it is moving at the speed of 24 frames per second, there's actually like a subconscious break in what you're seeing, right? Um, there is a literal... Uh, you know, sub-second blackness every second. And your brain kind of has to fill in the gaps because, uh, you know, the frame rate of reality is much, much higher. And so your brain at the subconscious level is, is having to, like, fill in the gaps and reach and make assumptions, and it likes that. It gives you something to do, and it's interesting because it, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't uh, give you all of the information. And, you know, in 2022, we might object to that and say, you know, that's that's bad or whatever. But I think it's, it's interesting. And he goes a little bit further into that theory um, in this chapter called Cut Up the... No, Most with the Least. Um, and I'll just read you a passage here while we listen to Time Safari do its thing. The underlying principle always try to do the most with the least, with the emphasis on try. You may not always succeed, but attempt to produce the greatest effect in the viewer's mind by the least number of things on screen. Why? Because you only want to do what's necessary to engage the imagination of the audience. Suggestion is always more effective than exposition. Past a certain point, the more effort you put into wealth of detail, the more you encourage the audience to become spectators rather than participants. And it's that last part that I think is applicable to sound and making music with synthesizers or, or anything else. When we reduce the, the bit depth here, I think my ears and my brain become uh, active participants instead of just being a spectator. They have to reach and think, wait, what is that sound? I think I've heard something like that before, but I, I don't know. Like, and, and now I'm engaged. A big part of my music is taking familiar sounds and processing them in unfamiliar ways. So I might put a guitar or a piano or my voice into these modules. And I think it's it's really interesting to me because, you know, there's it's like familiarity and, unf and unfamiliarity um, in equal measure. And I don't know. I don't know why I like that. It's <laughs> probably getting into some kind of um, uh, deep dive on, on my my brain and what's going on there but let's not do that let's let's move on um another fun thing about time safari watch your ears uh we want 8 bit yep another fun thing about time safari is that uh if you have the, the little expander this uh pitch input will here we go if the buffer is uh at full res like this and we send a trig into that input it will jump up an octave i just want to do probability 30 to send a trigger out of that i'm going to change the trigger time to 250 milliseconds. So listen to the little octave jumps. 
every time this light lights up. Which it probably won't do now that we're looking. Now, like I mentioned, it's a buffer playground, right? So if we shorten the loop here... We get really interesting stuff. Scan the buffer. If you move these sliders past one another, it'll play backwards. Fun, right? Okay. Well, what if we were to modulate this and change the length of the buffer automatically? Well, let's jump back into script one. No, actually, let's fire up a new script. Script two that we want to go every time. And let's say TO, which is TXO. We're talking to this module behind the scenes too. CV1. Um, volts. RAND 5. It's going to generate a random voltage between 0 and 5. We're going to tell this script to fire every tick, right? So all we want is script 2 in the metro there. Boom. Now it's going to change voltage every time. And if we send that voltage into the end point, and we use the attenuverter to turn that into a negative voltage because it wants 0 to 5 which we specified make it negative so it's going to actually send this slider backwards check that out very good I'm going to flip the record switch off so that we keep what's in the buffer, because we're going to come back to this module in a minute. I lied earlier because I said I was going to show you the analog thing first, and I didn't do that because I'm a forgetful human, but let's jump in there now. Alrighty, so I'm going to... I'm going to bail out of this. Give me one second. We'll take the mix out of Just Friends. I'm going to go into this module called Tromso by Bastel. And... Undo all these time being. We're going to make a good old-fashioned mess today. There's plenty of YouTube videos where everything's nice and pretty. We're going to make a different kind. I'm going to switch this over to Sound Sustain, which just... Uh, sings out notes without any kind of enveloping and that's going in we'll come out of the trom so into the middle input of nearness and we'll just monitor from there how about that that'll work says the synth okay so you may have seen the term sample and hold here or there if you've been doing synthesis or mess with guitar pedals or, or whatever. This one really messed me up for a long time. Like it was the hardest thing to understand. So I'm going to attempt to explain sample and hold to you very quickly and I'll probably do it wrong and if so, uh, roast me in the comments. That's totally fine. But essentially, a sample and hold takes uh, two inputs. One, it takes a signal input, so we would maybe send like a sine wave into the input, and it also takes a clock input or a gate input. And essentially, if we've got a sine wave going up and down, um, <clears throat> coming in, a sample and hold grabs a value from whatever is coming into the input, in our theoretical case, a sine wave, and it hangs on that value until it receives the next clock pulse. So. What we would see from our output, if we pulsed right here, would be this. 
and then if we pulsed again it might jump down here if we pulse again it might jump up here because it's taking a sample from wherever that input is right when it grabs uh, a gate or a clock signal um, a lot of times random things are actually sample and holds with or without slew applied because it's a great way to generate random values like if you send just white noise into a sample and hold module and hit it with a clock it's going to produce uh, a different value every time because noise is all over the place now here's a fun trick if you were to send audio into a sample and hold or a track and hold which we will not get into but it's slightly different for the argument of what we're going to do here it's not all that different but if you were to send audio into that unit and you were to send a clock in at audio rate well what you would get is something that looks kind of like a saw wave but again like we were saying with the time safari has less sample points right because we're not clocking it at, at the same audio rate as the audio coming in we're, we're let's say we're clocking it at like 100 hertz well okay this is the part where i stop talking to show you what it sounds like because that's what the bastel tromso does to sample and hold um but the clock is built in and it can be lfo rate or audio rate and as i roll this back you'll hear the detail of the signal start to fade away See how we're beginning to lose detail? If we keep going, eventually it sounds like a chopped tremolo, doesn't it? Again, because we're grabbing pieces of the signal every time the clock pulses. And if the clock gets slow enough, we just get little tiny pieces. As we get up into audio rate, it's kind of chunky and nonsensical. Then it's nothing. Then it's our signal again. And I find that analog bit crushing sound just utterly beautiful. I love it. Pretty great, right? And this is something you can make yourself um, with, you know, a stock sample and hold module and an, an LFO that will go up into audio rate. Try this. You might really like it. I think we're actually on track and hold right now. If you want to hear what the difference. It's subtle. Really pretty. Again, because there are gaps in the waveform, and I think that I at least really like the feeling of my brain trying to figure out what the heck is going on. I'll let you listen to that for a minute and uh, oh you know what let's do this could be fun is to also in script 2 say output 2 of TXO could be negative 5 negative 5 to 5 know what I mean Then we could take that and patch it into the modulation input, which has an attenuator.
and then we're going to change the slew so to.cv dot slew two to 500 milliseconds and that's going to smooth it out I'm going to let you listen to that while I patch up the next thing Okay, so the next thing is another fun way to kind of like faux do this is um, to use a real wonky envelope to animate and open your VCA. Um, let me pull this quick, monitor the same way that we were earlier. All right, so there's our unaffected signal, but Zadar is uh, my favorite envelope uh, modulation tool. It's a great modulation tool in general, but it has these really non-standard waveforms. And if you see this one, you can see the physical gaps, right? It's real stuttery. And when I plug this in, ah, oh, that's so good. Isn't that great? Just very lovely. And the other fun thing to do with this one is actually modulate this. It'll move. So now it's not standard at all. Highly recommend Zadar. Um, and there are all kinds of wackadoo envelopes in here. Shall we peruse a few? They're not all gappy like this, but, you know, there are some that are... There's the T section. Those are... And some of them are pretty weird and cool. But yeah, with a VCA and a weird envelope, um, you can also create the kinds of gaps that we're discussing today that I find interesting. Um, a couple of more, and then we'll just like bring all this together in a big patch. Uh, and one that I have only recently acquired after many years of searching. It's the Bionic Lester Mark I, which is a switched capacitor filter. I'm not an expert in what switched capacitor filters do, but I think the idea is that they filter the signal by kind of jumping back and forth between two values. And uh, that requires a clock to tell it how fast to jump. And please correct me in the comments if any of this is wrong and educate everybody. Um, but what's cool about Bionic Lester is you can choose which cutoff frequency the uh, clock signal is coming from. And so as you lower that, you get into this interesting, reduced, sample-y, goopy, gappy thing that I'm fawning over all day long, all evening long. Uh, let's just take a listen. So here it kind of gets chunky. It's a stereo filter, so what might be even more interesting would be if we did this. And grab 
grabbed our four voice thing. Hook that back up. So now we've got both sides rocking. And this is where I really love this module. Kind of down in the the basement. If you pick both as the clock source, you can get in some truly awful noises. And I mean that as a compliment. It's not, but it is. You know what I mean? And then two modules that get an honorable mention here and will be used in the patch that I make in a minute are Databender and Nautilus. I get the feeling that the, the guys and gals at Qubit uh, feel the same way that I do about uh, bit reduction because uh, there are some really rockin' bit crush algorithms on both of these modules. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that I think this theory holds true for distortion and fuzz as well. You know, because if you look at a, a distorted signal or overdriven signal, what you're doing is taking a sine wave and and chopping its head off. You're creating a gap. You're creating a piece of information that's missing. And I think our brains hear that and go like, oh wow, that is the sound of a guitar, except it's not. It's been transformed because the wave shape is different. And one of my favorite distortion tools in my rack is Cold Mac. Let me just show you that real quick. If you send a signal, <sighs> nope. into these inputs, which are the AND and OR inputs, and then monitor the output. You can get this really beautiful sputtery distortion sound as you move the uh, survey knob away from center. Isn't that beautiful? So yeah, a bit of an addendum there that I think that what I'm talking about applies to distortion too. It's a bit of a stretch, but... You know what? That's okay. It's the least crazy thing you'll hear on YouTube today. All right, so that's my working theory for how uh, Walter Murch's thoughts on 24 frames uh, per second and, you know, editing with as few cuts as possible so that the audience becomes a participant instead of a spectator, transfers directly to the world of modular synthesizers. Uh, if you're still with me, I hope you enjoyed this uh, endeavor. I don't know what to call what I'm doing here. But what I'm going to do now, let me explain this before I do it, because then I'll stop talking and just make music, and you can listen to it if you're working or whatever 
uh, just leave this on and it'll be mostly pleasant, hopefully. No promises. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize all six voices now, and I'm going to send those into these different modules we've talked about. And we're going to reunite all of those signals in the qubit synapse. And basically the synapse will mix between sources that come in here, and it will output... See how the LEDs link up down below? It's because it's sending the, a mixture of these two inputs to this output. So what I like to do is treat a couple of these as a stereo pair and send those into the Enhance 2, which lets you control the width and the, the position in the stereo field as well as, well as some cool uh, mid-side controls here. And we'll generate our kind of jumpy stereo field in that way. And I will have signals kind of popping in, popping out, and I really like throwing them around left and right and how when we send a trigger from Teletype to the scatter input, you really don't know where the sound that you were hearing in your left ear is going to be next. It might be in the middle, it might be in the right ear, it might be gone. Um, but I'm going to build that patch here, and thanks for watching. You know, if you want to see more ridiculous videos like this, I guess subscribe, um, or just come back here. You know, I mean, how to work the internet, right? Um, yeah, go forth, make music, um, hit me up with any questions in the comments, and I, I'll usually reply uh, at some point. Um, yeah. Thanks. Here's some music.